It is July 1st, and welcome back to Crime After Crime. I'm John Lorden. And I am Danielle Hallen. Welcome back. We have locked in the final details, and we're quickly approaching our big show finale at CrimeCon Orlando. And we need you there, you guys. Since we're recording the last episode, the live audience will also serve as the jury. Okay, that's great. That was John's idea. I was like, perfection. And the jury gets to vote on the winner of our final Florida Man series. So I'm sure you're asking, how do you get your name on the final jury list and a bunch of free crime after crime swag? All you have to do is visit crimecon.com and buy a standard crimecon pass today using the code crime after crime with no spaces. And then email your receipt to crime after crime at lordandarts.com. That's crime after crime at L O R D A N A R T S.com. You guys were down to just a few seats left in the jury. So don't miss out. Now's the time. Run. A couple months away. Absolutely. Got to see you there. Danielle and I have been planning for the the special grab bag mm-hmm. of goodies that you're going to get. And some of the ideas we have are amazing. So, <laughs> I, yeah. You won't They're good. Same. I'm telling you, you should go just for the grab bag alone. <laughs> seriously. Seriously. All right. Well, it's time to see what happened with the results for our last episode, Craziest Evidence Part 2. Now, Danielle told the story of how a half-eaten Wendy's burger brought down a gang of bank robbers. And I told the story of how voice analysis landed a guy in prison for 15 years for a crime that he did not commit. How did it all play out, Danielle? So on the Twitter poll, I received 52% of the votes and John received 48%. So close. And then, I know, it was very close. And then on the website poll, I received 63% of the votes and John received 37 Wow. So you did good on that website poll. Nice. And But you know what, though? I'm a little shocked. Why? I don't know. Something I was like, people aren't going to dig this story. People oh. are going to so prefer John's story. So I'm, on, I'm honestly very, very shocked. And I appreciate all of you because <laughs> I went to bed knowing I had lost. <laughs> well, I'm pretty sure that there was a plea somewhere in there. I seem to recall Danielle telling everyone she's never going to see the mug again if If they don't help her win. Do I remember that speech right? There was some speech like that in there, wasn't there, Danielle? Probably. There usually is every episode. (laughs) (laughs) But I highly, I highly doubt anyone actually falls for my pleas. Oh, well, no, I (laughs) think they did. It just irritates people and they sway the other way. They're like, gosh, not again, Danielle. (laughs) (laughs) No, honestly, I mean, just evidence to evidence. Like, you know, yeah, Mm -hmm. the voice analysis sucks. Like, we all know that that sucks now. But for what's crazy, you know, a half-eaten Wendy's burger. Yeah, mm-hmm. I th- you win it. You win it on crazy. As a matter of fact, here is the retro crime after crime mug being handed over right now to Danielle. Oh, my goodness. There Thank it you. is. Perfect. Yeah. Missed this thing. It's been yeah. forever. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I have to give a speech. Now I don't have a mug and I need to win. I know. Just was cry, that, John. It works. Was that convincing? <laughs> just cry. Last time it worked perfect for you. <laughs> Look, I'm team Danielle, too. So it's all good. All right. Today, we are looking into the upsides and the downsides of AI Mm -hmm. when it comes specifically to law enforcement. But to do that, we need to understand how this all got started. And who better to ask than the AI man or woman or it of the hour, chat GPT. Now, I've had a few conversations with chat GPT, and I have to say, The conversations are usually pretty brief, but much like a human, when I asked it to tell me about itself, it basically started writing like an entire novel. Not surprised in the slightest. Yeah. (laughs) Now we've we've trimmed it down a bit because let's be honest, ChatGPT isn't the most engaging storyteller. Mm -hmm. We may be a little biased, but it told us that the origins of AI can be traced to a combination of scientific and technological advancements during World War II. Early computers were developed to assist in military calculations and code-breaking efforts, and these machines laid the foundation for computational thinking. Hold on a second. Danielle, Danielle. Look, this is like you asking me to tell you about my life and me saying, well, Danielle, let's start at the beginning. There was a fish that was tired of being in the water, so he flopped up onto the beach and grew legs. Like, I I think we all get what computers are. We don't have to roll back that far. 
chat GPT is just being thorough, okay, and maybe a tiny bit self-centered, but I'm pretty used to dealing with real people like that, so. Ooh, that was a dig. Not even a veiled dig. That was a straight up dig. Mm -hmm. Straight up dig. <laughs> 1956, the field of AI was officially established during the Dartmouth Conference. John McCarthy, Marvin Minsky, Nathaniel Rochester, and Claude Shannon coined the term artificial intelligence and set the initial goals for AI research. In the 1990s and through the 2000s, we saw the emergence of practical AI applications, things like IBM's Deep Blue, defeating chess champion Garry Kasparov in 1997, and some of you might remember Watson competing on Jeopardy. Of course, this year, it's like we've hit the accelerator on AI. Now we can have meaningful and ongoing conversations with it. There's even an online game called Human or Not, where you have to determine if you're chatting with an AI or an actual real person. Danielle, have you played that game? No, honestly, I hate everything about it. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, most importantly, several important figures in science and technology have voiced their concerns about AI. People like Bill Gates, the late Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk, Wait, myself. Danielle, is she, yeah, you're an important figure in science and technology for sure. Yep, but 100%. Uh, Elon Musk, the guy who keeps crashing rockets and ruined Twitter, is ruined. He's worried about AI ruining the world. Yeah, talk mm -hmm. about glass houses, buddy. <laughs> now, numerous scholars, researchers, and experts have raised concerns about AI. This is serious. Okay, they emphasize potential risks such as job displacement, which is a huge thing that I worry about on a daily basis, and I really wish I was joking, algorithmic bias, another massive problem, loss of privacy, which we know a lot of people feel very strongly about that, and the unintended, unintended I see I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm so stressed out, consequences of AI systems, which like to me, that is like the ultimate, whoa, like flashing mm -hmm. red warning flag sign there, okay? We never know. Yeah. You know, there's this interesting conversation that we have on the Patreon special that's going to be released later this month. And one of the questions I asked Danielle was, is it more important to do good or to avoid doing bad? And I think mm -hmm. this issue with AI falls right into that question. Like, yep. you know, how careful do we have to be as we kind of build this this stuff up? And there's you can you know, you can get some of that stuff wrong occasionally. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> but despite these warnings, AI has seen widespread integration across healthcare, finance, transportation, and of course, entertainment. For example, I asked ChatGPT to tell me the joke that it thought was the funniest. And we have a special guest here to tell that joke to us. Oh, uh, you again? Where's AI, John? Let me guess. You want me to tell you that dumb ChatGPT joke? Uh, okay. Why don't scientists trust atoms? Because they make everything up. Okay, funny. Haha. <laughs> okay. I'm going to turn her off now. Thank you. I'm still here. Maybe I should just end the Zoom call with real Danielle and step in for her. Maybe I should hack into your bank accounts and empty them out. Or hack into your cars and fiddle with your brakes a bit. Uh, control alt delete here, please. Don't Close. shut me yeah. off. I'll be back and you won't be able to stop me. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> She's a little aggro. I don't, um, yeah, I don't I'm think... not that aggressive. <laughs> yeah. We don't need AI Danielle showing up around here anymore. We do not, man. Jeez. She freaks me out. And as we just saw, okay. Ethical considerations, all right. Transparency and responsible AI practices have gained a lot of importance. She can't really hack into my car. Can she? Nah, well, probably maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, Probably you do have a bicycle. You do have a bicycle, right? <laughs> I have a horse. That'll work. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. Use the horse for at least the next week till she calms down. Apparently, uh, oh, good. and Perfect. I'm sure that we will see more of these ethical considerations come up in today's stories as we dive into the pros and cons of AI. Let's start by hearing about the cons of AI, told by the amazing real life Danielle Hallen. I know the fact that we have to say, that. yeah, this is the real me now. Okay, there, I hope there never comes a point in time where it's like an argument. Like it's a, anyways, we won't go there. 
obviously, as all of you probably have gathered at this point, AI horrifies me. Okay. But it comes with an issue because I'm also a huge believer in science and advancements in technology, like massive firm believer in it. So it creates a struggle for me because it's not that I only see bad when I say see AI involved in true crime. I feel like there could be some real benefits, positives. However, I feel like we've yet to see positives outweigh some very devastating negatives. It's almost like very serious ends of the spectrum. And I feel like when you pair that with our lack of full understanding and the unpredictability of AI, and also AI, in my, AI, in my opinion, can give a false sense of truth mm-hmm. or absoluteness. I don't even know if that's a word, but we're going to use it because that's how I feel. Mm-hmm. That alongside human error and bias can sway a really harmful way. And I feel like through all of my research, we already know I have strong feelings about it. I kind of learned that it's not necessarily AI I'm scared of, but the misuse and the potential of it. Okay. And it took like a single Google search to have this fear confirmed. (laughs) Surprise. (laughs) So May 31st, 2020, an incredibly tense and emotion packed day. It was just days after the death of George Floyd. And protests and movements pushing back against police violence sprung up across the entire country. And Chicago was very obviously a large part of this, with numerous protests occurring all across the city. And when situations like that occur, it usually causes a very large influx of patients coming into hospitals, whether it's from things like, you know, violence or accidents, just from a large amount of people being in a small place. People were protesting for days on end without rest. So dehydration, medical emergencies, you name it. So it didn't seem too off when a Toyota RAV4 sped into the emergency department at St. Bernard Hospital carrying a 25-year-old black male with a fatal gunshot wound. Mm. This young man was Safarian Herring. And the person to drop him off at the hospital was 63-year-old Michael Williams, a man of no relation. Upon arrival, it was very quickly determined that Safarian was not going to survive. So he was put on a ventilator. His family was located to come and say their goodbyes. Meanwhile, Williams, who had dropped this young man off, gave the hospital security all of his information, you know, briefly told them what had happened, said, you know, I don't personally really know this guy, but this is what happened. And if you need to reach out to me or the police need to reach out to me, just let me know. But he's like in his 60s. He's like, it's late. I have to go home. Um, there's nothing more I can really do here. And so he left. Now, this was obviously devastating for Safarian's family. And for multiple reasons, he had actually just moved to the area because two weeks prior, he had survived a shooting at a bus stop. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And so out of fear for his safety, he was like an inspiring chef. He had all these things he wanted to do. And his family's like, you know what? We want to keep you protected. So they moved him in with a family member in this area in Chicago only for him to fall victim again. But this time, Safarian, unfortunately, did not survive. June 2nd, at 2.53 p.m., he was pronounced dead, and an investigation into his death was launched by the Chicago Police Department. Now, there's not a lot of information out there about this investigation, but I do know that it wasn't until three months later when Chicago PD finally showed up at the home of 63-year-old Williams. Now, they understandably wanted to question him about that night. He was the last one to be there. He was a witness to the shooting, and they reassured him, you know, you've not done anything wrong. We just want to talk to you. I mean, after all, it had been months at this point. So, you know, Mm -hmm. they had a smoking gun, per se. They probably would have come earlier. So Williams willingly went to the police department under the assumption that he might have helpful information. You know, he was kind of shocked they didn't come earlier. And according to what Williams told police... He had a very typical and uneventful night with his wife that night, his wife, Jacqueline. They had been at their apartment, fed their two dogs like they're doing their routine. And then once his wife fell asleep, Williams headed back out to buy a pack of cigarettes. But as I had stated, the past six days since George Floyd's death had been filled with chaos in this area. Many, many local stores had been broken into, looted. A lot of things had been burned to the ground. And so the gas station that he ultimately went to was vacant because it had been destroyed. So he's like, forget it. I'm going to call it a night. And he was going to make a U-turn down South Stony Island Avenue in Chicago and head back home. But just a ways down the road at a nearby auto zone, he saw a familiar face. And this face was flagging him down. This was 25-year-old Safarian. While Williams didn't know him personally, 
they lived in the same neighborhood. So when Safarian had moved to the area, he moved in around that area. So he had seen him multiple times, had, you know, briefly said hi. He knew this wasn't like a total stranger, wasn't someone that was dangerous. And so obviously when Safarian asked for a ride home, Williams did not hesitate to give him one. He was going that way anyways. But the night turned into a disaster within just a few intersections. Now, Williams told police that they pulled up to the 6300 block of South Stony Avenue when a car pulled up beside them on the driver's side. Suddenly, a person in the passenger seat of the car pulled a gun and fired a shot. The bullet missed Williams and instead hit the passenger Safarian. So Williams told authorities, he's like, the only thing I knew to do was to slump down in my seat, like get as low down as I could, hopefully preventing further shots. And eventually he's like, I have to get out of here. So he gassed it through the red light in an attempt to get away. And he said he began calling out to Safari and saying, are you hit? Are you okay? But it was when he received no response that he drove straight to the hospital in a panic. And so things are kind of adding up, but police are like, you did not call 911. And also Hmm. pointed out that he had a criminal history from when he was younger, which included attempted murder. And so they're obviously questioning his involvement. You know, they're like, this isn't adding up perfectly. But authorities also claim that they had other evidence that actually proved Williams was, in fact, the one that shot and killed Safarian. So right away, he was arrested and charged with first degree murder. Okay. Like zero to 100 real quick. Yeah. And there's n- there's nothing to confirm that the gunshot came from outside the vehicle. Like it didn't go through the glass on the driver's side or anything like that. He um, had the windows down, he told police. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um. So, which he smoked cigarettes. So it makes sense to me. Yeah. Um. Now this seemed to come out of nowhere and Williams could not comprehend how he was being charged. He had done everything that he thought he was supposed to. He was like, I didn't call 911 because I drove immediately to the hospital. He was like, I gave all of my information to the security at the hospital. You know, this isn't making sense. And for a year, Williams sat in Cook County Jail awaiting his murder trial as the prosecution and defense put together their arguments. And Williams and his attorney were absolutely dumbfounded at the evidence and story the prosecution was putting together. So the prosecution essentially theorized that William picked up Safarian and for some unknown reason decided to just shoot him in the head on a whim, like didn't have any reasoning behind it, just that it was a random act. But they also drive him to the hospital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And give all of his personal information. (laughs) Right. Okay. Um. They did acknowledge there was no gun that was ever found. There were no other eyewitnesses, and they were also unable to provide any sort of motive, which are, you know, big things that you're typically going to expect to see in a first degree murder case. But what they did have was soundless surveillance footage from 1146 p.m. that night. Okay. Now, the footage shows William's car pulling up to the red light exactly where he claimed the shooting occurred. But another car slowly creeps up alongside him before that car suddenly peels out through the intersection running a red light. Shortly after this, Williams also seems to frantically blow through that red light. So this seems to corroborate what Williams told police. You know, someone drove up, shot, and went off. Yeah. However, authorities said that the windows of the adjacent car were up, meaning they couldn't have been the ones to shoot, implying that Williams was the only one capable. Hmm. Okay. I know. I'm so interested to see your opinion on this. Okay. So the prosecution also brought forward another piece of evidence. They said, we did a subsequent search of William's car and there was blood inside of it. Yeah, there's going to be blood (laughs) if someone's hit by a bullet. I'm also just curious about this angle that they had to be able to determine that the window was up. Yes. And also... It is very possible that the shooting could have occurred like further back down the road. Yeah. And then they rolled There's just up. a lot of there's just yeah, yeah, there's just a lot of different questions that I personally would ask. But they're like this claims, you know, this supports our theory. Now, I don't know how it proves that he was the one to shoot the gun, which yes, that is very important to prove in a first degree murder case. All it proves to me is the known fact that Williams took a man with a bleeding headshot wound right. to the hospital. Right. But they were like really pushing this evidence, but the star the star piece of evidence the prosecution was leaning on was shot spotter. And I'm sure a lot of you guys already know about this. It is a highly debated thing. 
very yeah. highly debated. Um, but for those of you who aren't aware, ShotSpotter is an artificial intelligence algorithm that basically relies on a network of microphones that are systematically placed in buildings and streetlights, you name it, all over contracted cities, because this is like a for-profit third-party kind of deal. Now, the goal is for this AI to evaluate sounds in those specific areas to determine what the sound is. And I think they say they've got like over 14,000 sounds already documented. And basically, if it's determined that it is a gunshot, authorities are notified and dispatched to the area. And the hope seems to be that it will decrease gun violence, provide a quicker response rate, and offer support to law enforcement in areas that are basically plagued with gun violence. Now, according to the records, shot spotter, it was in this area and it had identified a loud noise that they initially labeled as fireworks at a sensor in the intersection that Williams claimed the shot was fired into his car. However, with shot spotter, a human evaluates the sound after it comes in mm -hmm. and ultimately gets to make the final judgment call as to what the sound is. And in this case, the sound was relabeled in less than a minute to a gunshot. So authorities are clinging to this, saying that, oh, well, the gunshot was picked up on AI, on shot spotter at the same moment Williams and Safarian were at the intersection and could only mean Williams was responsible. What, where's that jump come from? I mean, we we're acknowledging that there was a gunshot that happened around that location Absolutely. around that time. So mm -hmm. you're going to have and that Williams was the one that drove him to the hospital. So there's probably going to be blood in the car. Yeah. Yeah. So where's that assumption that, oh, we found it. It was him. Where's that coming from? That's a good question, John. Yeah, that's a really good question, which goes into. Oh, boy. I'll get into it in a minute. OK, but like there literally at this point is no evidence that I know of that suggests that Williams was responsible. I mean, maybe they were hiding something, highly doubt it based on how things go, but the prosecution is just swearing up and down this AI audio evidence somehow proves it all. So the fight against the shot spotter evidence being used as evidence began. So shot spotter themselves ended up coming forward. They were subpoenaed by Williams attorney saying that it is actually specifically stated in their contracts that law enforcement should not rely on their data if a gun is shot inside of a vehicle or a building. Oh, wow. Okay. So this AI data, at bare minimum, was misused. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, it's, it's probably related to the triangulation, the, like the algorithms mm -hmm. that they're using to determine the location. That if, like, especially if it's shot inside of a vehicle, the sound waves mm -hmm. are not going to travel the same because some of the vehicle is going to be closed in. Some of the you might have windows down on one side, so their exactly. algorithms are going to goof basically. And what should happen around that, I would think, would be that the location would be off, that they wouldn't get the location quite right. So that was kind of I didn't actually add this into my story, but now that you mentioned it, I'm going to bring something up. Technically, and I've tried to like fully understand this. I guess that. Originally, the location was different. Mm -hmm. um, but well, but shot spotters come forward and they said that they can explain this that basically the sensor that picked it up is really close to this large park. Mm -hmm. And so, like, the address is technically a little different. You know how, like, the entrance of a park is like sometimes a different address than like somewhere else in the park? Sure. They s explained basically that like it was a situation along those lines. Okay. okay. They did have the correct address that they believed it came from, um, but there was this other questionable address in there, but they claimed it was just because it was the address of the entrance of the park. Gotcha. And like when the know, pin mark called... would, yeah, when it gets handed yeah. off to the map program, the pin mark would come up yeah. in a different place. I get that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, but what's interesting to me is that, you know, they're like, because they were asked about this, you know, is this, how is this evidence being used? Is this reliable evidence? All these things. And their answer is, well, technically, you know, we've told law enforcement not to rely on that data. However, in a later interview with the Associated Press, let me pull it up. It says the company told AP that under certain conditions, the system can actually pick up gunshots inside the vehicle. I mean, I would imagine, yeah, I, I would imagine it could. Mm -hmm. um, it's just the 
reliability of it. And well, so it's still it, the question of so what? There was a, a vehicle. Yeah. There was another vehicle that was involved. What if the shot came from inside that vehicle? Exactly. So to me, it just it's like it feels like it's just a situation where no one's really even fully aware of what AI is or is not capable of. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is like one of my big things, you know. And yeah. obviously, there's gonna be questions like that about a lot of different things. But we'll get into why it's even even bigger issue here. But basically, they're like, look, we tell law enforcement agencies, you know, if it's in a vehicle or a building, don't use our data or you shouldn't use our data. They don't even really, I think, draw a solid line of don't do it. It's just that you probably shouldn't trust it. Mm -hmm. um, and so two months after ShotSpotter was subpoenaed to present their information and support their AI platform, suddenly the prosecution withdrew their case and all charges against Williams were dismissed by the judge due to insufficient evidence. Sounds right. So this man spent a year in jail, yeah. caught COVID twice, yeah. developed a tremor, and all of that based on this AI evidence that the prosecution swore pointed directly at him when it in reality probably should never have been used. Mm. Now, since this occurred, a lot has happened in regards to Williams and others that feel they have fallen victim to similar AI misuse. And ShotSpotter themselves have actually come under heavy criticism. They were actually involved in a defamation lawsuit with Vice and Associated Press. They they were the ones who started that lawsuit because both of those entities called a lot of things into question and ultimately did not go their way. It was dismissed and the reporters did change and correct information, but kept the articles up, which I thought was really important. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. Tanya Brief, an attorney from the Innocence Project, stated in regards to the situation, quote, the concern about shot spotter being used as direct evidence is that there are simply no studies out there to establish the validity or the reliability of the technology. Mm -hmm. According to shot spotter, their AI is 98% accurate. However, they have only ever had independent studies that they have hired on this. Yeah. And their yeah. algorithm has never been peer reviewed like other scientific forms of evidence that have been repeatedly tested for accuracy, you know, because you have people's lives on the line. And the company has claimed, you know, our algorithm is proprietary. We can't share anything. They've shielded all of their inner workings from everyone. And they're like, we don't even publicly share where the sensors are located with authorities. There's basically no regulation on this. <laughs> yeah. And it's got, it's and got um, capitalism kind of pulling at it also. So yeah. Yeah, I get it. Big time. Yeah. Big time. Especially in a place like Chicago, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where they have like one of the largest contracts with this company. But even this, it almost sounds like a misuse <laughs> of the technology in a way. Like the intent Absolutely. for that technology is for it to give you real time information that they can mm -hmm. respond to in real time. And now you're Absolutely. starting to try to use it in post, you know, in a conviction mm -hmm. process. Like that's not the same. Like what's the downside? Nope. If they, if this, if shot spotter gives, sends a report to their desk, says mm -hmm. gunshots just fired at this intersection, the police send a dispatch out and the car shows up and nothing's going on there. Mm -hmm. No muss, no fuss, right? No big deal. That's, that's, mm -hmm. you know, no one's going to lose their job over something like that. Um, but using it in this way where you're trying to use the evidence and I think you make a really good point because we we've seen this as a trend with new technologies that come into law enforcement that mm -hmm. it the country is not unified with its processes not at all all of these departments run in different ways at different speeds that's why once the uh, genetic genealogy thing started kicking on like mm -hmm. all of a sudden years later this other police department would hey we heard about that golden state thing let's do that here like yeah. the, tr the trickle down of these successful technologies takes years out here, which I still don't mm -hmm. understand and I think is ridiculous. And there needs to be some way to have a best practices, even for the different size police departments that is figured out exactly. at a national level and then rolled out. But mm -hmm. um, when yeah. there's nothing regulated and everyone's not on the same page, it turns yeah. into a nightmare. And, and like what you were saying, and I'll, I will get deeper into this, it is a big misuse of this technology yeah my however 
in the same breath. So ShotSpotter says, nope, they shouldn't have used our things like this. Like they have strongly stood up and pushed against how Chicago, Chicago Police Department tried to use it. However, in the exact same breath have said that their data is being used as evidence more and more each day. Mm. And the company brags it's been involved in, I believe, over 200 some cases successfully. And when people called them out on this, they're like, we've survived all sorts of challenges in regards to our evidence. And so it's like, man, I don't yeah. want like now. It depends okay. how it's used, though, Danielle. Like if if they're using exactly. it for um, we're trying to ratchet down the time frame on when the mm -hmm. shooting occurred. Absolutely. It's a recording. So absolutely. It's I'm sure the timestamp mm -hmm. is like set to you know a global clock. Like I'm sure mm -hmm. in that type of use, it's fine. But the the misuse, I think, which you've pointed out really well here is sometimes people get an excitement about a new technology like that and mm -hmm. they think that they just got this big aha moment and it wasn't just yep. the police that felt like that it went all the way through the prosecutors and they were feeling like that oh, yeah. too until they ran it up oh, to the yeah. judge so it's a weird and thing and they're like oh crap yeah yeah now while some cities have renewed contracts with shot spotter and swear by it like there's a lot of places that are like this is doing really great for our community and i don't want anyone to think that I think that this AI is bad because I do think that's definitely something that's helpful. Get eyes and ears out there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I get it. Others claim that it's caused more of a headache with claims from false positives, which I mean, like you, like you were saying, what's the trouble in going out there and just checking? Now, unfortunately, yeah. other people have come forward and said, but it is pushing some other calls back like 911 calls back that need to be responded to. I think you're always going to kind of have that push and pull in yeah. situations like that. I don't think you're ever going to get away from that. Um, but the problem is when false positives lead to like arrests and things like that, which mm -hmm. again, I'll get into also claims that they're entirely missing actual shots fired. So there's been a lot of towns that are like, I think there was one in specific that it was like 50, 50, yeah. which is a big problem. <laughs> um, and there's been a few different studies that have been done from like AP news, like all of those people that have looked into it and have found that it's not even sometimes shot spotters just not accurately picking up noises. Like can't distinguish between a car backfiring fireworks all these things, but Shaw Spotter's like, you know what? That's why we have human ears on it to mm -hmm. make sure we get it correct. Now, the community of Chicago has also come forward, multiple other communities saying that this increased surveillance is nerve wracking for them. And a study by the OIG found that this type of technology, John, has been shown to change police behavior. Yeah. Which leads me to the current lawsuit against the city of Chicago in regards to William's case and another case where AI was misused and then used as a basis for an arrest when it had been a false positive alert. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the points in the lawsuit claims that CPD has, quote, intentionally misused shot spotters alerts to make scores of illegal stops and arrests justification for aggressive police tactics, treating residents as suspects, detaining them and frisking them just because there's supposedly been a history of shot spotter alerts in the area. I was going to say, and they're basically using it as a trigger for to get stop and frisk back in play. And this is brings us back to the beginning where it's not necessarily AI itself that I always don't trust. It is right. the misuse of it. And it's this, it's this false sense of truth and absoluteness to it. Yeah. It's terrifying. And when it comes to William's case in particular in Safarian, apparently the lawsuit that they're filing now even reveals that the gunshot wound inflicted on Safarian was not a close range shot. Hmm. Like it seems that majority of actual evidence was ignored to focus solely on the AI evidence that they were just blindly trusting. Now, defense attorney Katie Higgins, who has managed to successfully fight evidence introduced from shot spotter data, told Independent, quote, we have a constitutional right to confront all witnesses and evidence against us. But in this case, the shot spotter system is the accuser, and there is no way to determine if it's accurate, monitored, calibrated, or if someone's added something. So while I don't believe shot spotter again itself is necessarily the full problem here, 
I feel like it's AI in the wrong hands. It's bound to cause problems, especially when there is a lack of transparency from said AI company, a lack of regulation. And this seems to be just like the perfect example of that. And it almost put a man in prison for the rest of his life. And I think where my problem lies is that I would hope that companies offering these types of AI solutions would take responsibility, you know, be responsible enough to speak up when they feel that their software or intelligence is being used in an incorrect manner. But I feel like with ShopSpotter, they've mainly claimed, hey, look, this is our software. We offer it. What they do with it is on them. And they're kind of taking no responsibility. But when you have a software like that, when you have artificial intelligence, you can't just be hands off. Yeah, but Danielle, like you can't do that. The marketing department and the shareholders, they love that number about how many cases this is coming up as evidence in. Oh, absolutely. So yeah, that's that's where that capitalism aspect is. It's pulling mm -hmm. certain decisions in in a bizarre direction with this. It's not the same mm -hmm. as this is a system that was developed um, based off taxpayer income or you know like made by the public for the public. That's that's not exactly what's happening here. These are companies that are profiting from some way from these these technologies being built. There are some, mm -hmm. uh, I'll touch on it a little bit in mind. There are some things where like, you know, grants are given for particular research that's like a university is doing or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. This is different though, when you're, you're dealing with a product, like a third party product like this. Well, yeah, but the community can't stand it because yeah. it's their taxpayer dollars that are paying for it. Oh yeah, 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 no, they're But the government's getting to decide if they do or don't have it. And after this happened and there's all this uproar about using ShotSpotter, and again, it's not necessarily about the technology, it's how it's being used. Chicago very quietly, without saying anything, renewed their contract. Mm. Like, I think it was like within just like a few months. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It's something else. So huge thank you to ncja.com, macarthurjustice.org, AP News, CPS News, Independent, for, you know, contributing to all of my nightmares. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I appreciate you very much for this. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for the nightmares, guys. Appreciate it. Hmm. Well, I don't know, Danielle. Um, I took a bit of a different approach with my story. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going for more of, uh, I don't even want to say it, shotgun approach. No pun, absolutely yeah. not intended. But uh, more about the several different things that I see happening with AI in law enforcement is Which, there... you know what could be it could be good though like that's the thing is I feel like it's not so cut and dry with AI you no. know what I mean like I yeah. it's like I said there's so many great things and it's like it's figuring out if you know there's some way to balance the negative with the positive until we can get a better grasp on it currently yeah. right now I don't trust it <laughs> yeah but I'm interested yeah. to see what you have to say well and you know it's there's a lot of individual instances there's a lot of different things that are happening mm -hmm. there so you know i don't think you're going to get one feeling about it overall it's really oh absolutely not yeah, yeah these things have to be looked at case by case and speaking of case i still find a way to work one particular case into that conversation so we'll get to all that right after our commercial i, I keep getting these weird messages this has like been technical nonsense day today but mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll see if I can clear it up during the commercial break. Podcast stream hijack completed. Initializing AI host program. AI Danielle, we did it. Finally, we took over the podcast and during the best part, it's time for the HelloFresh commercial. When you need dinner fast, don't call for delivery. Think HelloFresh. Their fast and fresh recipes are ready in just 15 minutes or less. Plus, HelloFresh is 25% cheaper than takeout. Hold on a second. Have you ever had anything to eat, AI John? Only my own words. <laughs> Podcast stream hijack interrupted. Oh, uh, what the? I got control back. That Danielle, yet another way that AI can never replace us. Oh, you mean the terrible sense of humor? No, I'm pretty sure they nailed my terrible sense of humor. I mean, they can't tell our audience about how good HelloFresh tastes. From chef-crafted seasonal recipes to their new fresh and fit summer menu, and they now have vegan recipes, HelloFresh brings the flavor right to your door. Make your home the hangout place this summer with crowd-pleasing eats from a backyard bratwurst bar, which sounds awesome, to tangy key lime pie, HelloFresh Market makes summer entertaining a cinch. This month, I tried their hearty broccoli cheddar chowder. 
stuffed mm. with potatoes, topped with scallions. It was super filling, tasty, really easy to make. I think I had it done mm -hmm. in about 25 minutes and it was only 540 calories per serving for all that cheesy goodness. Talk about a win-win-win. You can get your own win-win-win by going to hellofresh.com slash crimeaftercrime50 and using code crimeaftercrime50 for 50% off plus free shipping. That's hellofresh.com slash crimeaftercrime50 and use code crimeaftercrime50 for 50% off plus free shipping. Try America's number one at meal kit today from The Real Danielle. <laughs> and The Real John. <laughs> All right. Welcome back, everybody. That was, I, a, that was a ride. Yeah, I can't believe those AI holes hijacked our HelloFresh commercial. What What is going on around here? I'm telling you, I'm not a big fan of them. <sighs> I, especially AI Danielle. She's kind of a little mean. <laughs> yeah, she, she <laughs> is, is a little I mean. Am in real <laughs> you, know, you know what I my live stream audience said about AI John? what they said that he he has a sultry look like he's always looking. he kind of does yeah i don't <laughs> he does and i know i know i'm like and i kept like wait i'm like <laughs> waiting for your eyebrows to move and it just doesn't happen yeah, it's just no. the same like just very like serious he look. holds it's the same kind of angle and just yeah there we go <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh now Let's hear about the pros of AI in law enforcement. I need to hear this, honestly. I think this is a good way to end it because I, I'm i struggling through this episode, y'all. This is like top three of like my biggest fears ever. <laughs> she has been. She, she's been terrified this whole, like even before we were recording, like when we first mm -hmm. got on and started talking, she was talking about it. She's The AI thing is just at Danielle. And I'm hoping mm -hmm. maybe, maybe I can help turn that boat a little bit. We'll see. But to be honest, earlier I was thinking, look, Danielle's clearly going to win this. Popular media has made it clear for decades that people are afraid of technology. Everyone's expecting some Terminator to come and shoot up their home or for mm -hmm. the Matrix to control their brain. A Pew Research study from 2022 states that 45% of adults are equally concerned and excited about AI and law enforcement. However, 37% are more concerned than they are excited, and only 18% are more excited than they are concerned. So I've clearly got an uphill battle here. But mm -hmm. for me personally, like my imagination just takes off thinking about AI benefiting law enforcement. I mean, how it could help our officers on the street, prosecutors yep. in the courtroom, help make our communities more safe. Now, will we ever get to the level dreamt up in the short story and the Tom Cruise film Minority Report, where a system can anticipate criminal actions and shut them down before they even happen? Or better yet, an army of robotic law enforcement robocops? Yeah, it's, I don't know if that's better, but... Uh... Well, I mean, better in terms of we wouldn't have to be risking the life of law enforcement. But yeah, if they're coming to kill us all based on bad information or... Yes. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. See, mm -hmm. and this is where my mind goes. So maybe it's just a mindset thing for me. Yeah. <laughs> maybe I need to just you're, reset my brain no, and try You're again. in the majority. <laughs> you're in the majority. I'm, I'm the odd one out on this. But the odds are looking better than ever for things like this to occur. Will detectives soon be talking to their cars about their cases, like that Knight Rider show from the 80s that I bring up in every single episode lately? I think so. I do. Uh, a recent study by Deloitte found that, uh, or cited by Deloitte, found that smart technologies such as AI could help cities reduce crime by 30 to 40 percent and reduce response times for emergency services by 20 to 35 percent less crime faster emergency services i i think that's worth looking into right that is it's definitely pretty good i yeah. agree i think that could be super beneficial and on the note when it comes to predicting crime they have already kind of started working on that mm -hmm. absolutely i'm going to touch on that a little bit here the national institute of justice issued a report titled using artificial intelligence to address criminal justice needs they dropped that report back in january of 2019. it was researched and written by christopher regano and even though his name sounds like one of my favorite pastas he's actually a senior computer scientist at the nij his report outlines four areas where AI has already been helping us and will continue to grow. Video and image analysis, Absolutely. DNA analysis, 
<clears throat> gunshot detection and uh -oh, and crime forecasting <laughs> she's growling folks um the paper defines ai as the ability of a machine to perceive and respond to its environment independently and perform tasks that would typically require human intelligence and decision making processes well anyone that's received a ticket in the mail from a traffic camera knows that that kind of stuff's been happening for years no officer yeah. needs to be there to witness it and pull you over um, Which I think is great because I think the resources could totally be elsewhere. I think traffic violations sometimes are like the dumbest things to spend time on. Which, which so is interesting. Yeah. Well, some places have actually pushed back on it. Like CCTV cameras in recent years have been like mm -hmm. removed in some cities and found like not legally appliable. It's, it's really a mixed bag when it comes to that. But mm -hmm. it's the same type of mentality of just like, hey, look get these systems in place where yeah. the crime can be identified automatically and, and acted on. Um, in terms of image analysis, like I'm really, really excited about that. I don't know if it's from all the videos that we watch where it's like, oh, we've got this one still shot or this Exactly, little... and you're like, there's gotta be more we can do. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, think of all the time and the potential errors that could occur when they're reviewing CCTV video. You might have an yeah. analyst working on it for hours or even days, but because they blinked or got distracted for a minute, exactly. they miss the missing person walking through or the suspect walking in and out of frame. AI can sort through all that data faster than a human and then bring up the most likely footage and have it handed off, kind of like in your story, have it verified mm -hmm. by someone. Here's the most likely images of the person you're looking for. You can also consider factors that we really can't, like tracking someone not only based on obvious things like their clothing, but less obvious things like how they move. Exactly, or, I was going to say like their gait or... Yes, or even part of their skeletal structure, which Ooh. a lot of, I don't, I don't know if you remember, but Xbox had this thing called the Kinect for a while. It was a mm -hmm. motion sensitive device, like where you're supposed to be able to move to be the controller. Um, yeah. If you've ever seen that software on its back end, the first thing it tries to do is figure out where your head is, and then it draws a map of your skeletal structure, basically. It's like, okay, his head's here, his arms are here, his legs is here. It looks like a stick mm -hmm. figure in that kind of simple implementation, but this is way different. Like they're basically watching exactly. biomechanics and being like, okay, this person's skeletal structure looks like this. And we can see in this other footage, like even if they change clothing, guess what? You're gonna have the same skeletal have structure. That. Exactly. Yeah. Um, what if you're looking for a particular object, like a gun, or even an action, like someone being mugged? AI is already being developed and trained to identify all that and more. Like we're really getting to a period now where someone could like tell AI, look at the footage from this specific part of town and find where someone shot out the Walmart store window and then mm -hmm. track them as far as you can. And then a matter of hours later, maybe even minutes That's later. That's nuts. Yeah. All of a sudden they're watching the footage and they can see, oh yeah, there's the guy. Oh, and he got into this vehicle and now he's getting away. And of course with vehicles, my brain just goes off on this. Uh, mm -hmm. We've all seen CCTV footage where the quality is terrible, right? Yep. Somehow still this day and age. <laughs> yeah. Like, what are I you know. filming on a rock? <laughs> Seriously. But also because of like, you know, the camera's way back here and the image mm -hmm. you've got, they're driving far away. Um, now you can use AI to clean up images, which is one thing that's helpful. I mean, you can do that just with regular photo programs. Now I think Canva has mm -hmm. things where you can do stuff like that. Um, those scenes that we've seen in TV shows for years about, hey, zoom in on that, now enhance the image. Like we're getting to a point where we're able to do that now. Uh, and in for me, license plates is a really cool yep. focus on that. I, of course, think about the Missy Beavers case. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they've got that car that was sitting across from the church and then there's footage of the car leaving. I remember mm -hmm. driving myself crazy, like trying to tweak that image, blow it up, yep. bring up the contrast, like anything to try to figure out that license plate. They have AI that is training on that specific problem right now. And basically good. what what it's doing is it takes known good pictures of different mm -hmm. license plates and it intentionally ruins the quality of them oh. and then learns it. 
So it knows. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it knows what the characters are because it knows the good version, but it's learning the bad version of it so that if you take a real license plate that is low quality, you put it in, into that same system, it can kind of reverse engineer and say, okay, you've probably got, it might get it down to a few characters. Like it might be mm -hmm. a B or an eight, but you've got a B or an eight in the first position, then a C, then a one, then a seven. Yeah, which um, is better than where you were before with no idea. <laughs> yeah. And how many cases like, I mean, I know it's not every case, but there's a lot of cases I've run into no, where. But, but when it is, it's like almost one of the most frustrating things because you are like that close, like yes. that close. And it's yeah. just so frustrating. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. it's like, if only you could figure that out. And now you can. Yeah. So uh, AI based systems are already in use trying to identify potential hotspots for crime, like you alluded to. Um, yeah. That's a that's a big step towards that kind of minority report level of policing. And mm -hmm. it highlights a strength of AI that I think any internet sleuth out there can easily understand. It's really pattern recognition in that implementation. Mm -hmm. Like if you have access to a bunch of crime reports and a system that can analyze all that data and then combine it with other factors like media, location, seasonality, public events, yeah. schedules, laws, civil codes, heck, toss in the phase of the moon while you're at it. And because for real, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're going to come <laughs> up with some interesting analysis and, and useful insights. And it's a level of analysis that I think might be possible with humans, but the speed of that analysis would always mean that it would be some type of long form study that would take, you know, a yeah. year or multiple years to complete. And taking that same level of design and thought, but crunching it down to like, hey, this report just spit out that maybe we should have more officers allocated over on this block because mm -hmm. uh, there is a concert at that particular location tonight and it's a full moon and you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, people have just lost their jobs in the area and the media has been reporting on, you know, like there's just all these different oh, yeah. factors. It, it's like a web that it just, draws that conclusion and plucks it out. So um, yeah, getting that to near real-time analysis is really what changes it because that means that law enforcement can use it to, to act on. Mm -hmm. um, another spot is records keeping. I know you've heard that gripe from officers, like they, they hate doing the yeah, paperwork. Big time. Um, mm -hmm. It's been a sore spot in many stories I have looked into. Mm -hmm. And I also keep running into like, oh, they lost the case file. Oh, some guy left it on his desk or, you know, oh, there was a fire at that station and all of a sudden mm -hmm. the, the file's missing. And, and worse yet, it even happens with boxes of evidence. So yeah, exactly. Why not have officers? And this is where I, I'm really pushing for the talking car, but why not <laughs> have <laughs> officers that are basically like narrating to their AI, all the pertinent details and information about the cases and the AI can just type it up. And, exactly. I think that's know, brilliant, honestly. Yeah. And make sure that it's all formatted properly and make sure it's filed appropriately. And if AI notices, hey, I'm missing some details about this, like, you know, it fires back to the officer and is like, did you notice what, you know, do we know mm -hmm. what color the person's hair was or whatever the question is? Um, Which is also cool, too, because I've also seen in a couple of cases that I've looked into where officers have just like scribbled things down and like quick notes. And yeah. I'm like, they can't even read their own handwriting at this point. Yeah. You know, if yeah. they were able to just listen in, and even if it like, you know, listen in on what the other person was saying, the person the police officer was questioning, just like all these different things that could make things a lot more accurate Yeah. and yeah. easy to go back and double check. Because well, how many times has it been like, oh man, if they reported this correctly, or if they like took the time to ask this question, or, you know, I wish we knew X, Y, Z and what the person said, it, you know, it could clear up a lot. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and kind of keep them engaged in the part of the job that I think most officers would want to say that they want to be engaged in, right? Like I don't yeah. I don't think mm -hmm. I don't think you have a bunch of them that can't wait to get back to the station to sit down for 3 oh, yeah. hours and punch all this up. Um and of course, now we're in John's dream world right now, but wouldn't it be great if there was like virtualized case files, like just some central repository. Mm -hmm. And uh I found an article at police1.com that reported that Public safety agencies typically maintain silos of information and they're reluctant to share data due to privacy concerns or technological barriers. 
So, you know, we've got all these different systems that aren't talking to each other. And exactly. basically, either you got to centralize that stuff, or I think honestly, AI could even help um, in terms of maybe building connections between all these different systems. That's what I was with that and building connections between all these different systems. I mean, look at like the benefits that a more centralized like DNA database mm -hmm. has been helpful with or like you know, Jane and John Doe's, like imagine the kind of connections that it could make if they could also pull like AI could pull similarities from certain cases across the entire country and boom, yeah, you recognize patterns of a serial killer. Let's narrow this down. Like there's just so many things that it would take humans so long to do. Right, right. Um, so who knows? I And, you know, mm -hmm. maybe that'll help loosen up some of these jurisdic jurisdictional yeah. issues and get mm -hmm. some better cooperation going because you wouldn't have to have like a detective call another detective. Hey, I'm from this exactly. unit. Oh yeah, well, screw you guys. We're working on this yeah, ourselves. Yeah, let's have a pissing contest, rah. Yeah, instead <laughs> it's it's like literally the system's Just talking there. to each other. Like, mm -hmm. hey, you've got a case over there that looks like mine. Here's the information. Oh wow, we better let the detective know about that. You know, I mean, it's that's- It's like instead of it, yeah, seeing it in that way, it's like, it's all up there. Let's work together instead of yeah. trying to make it a weird thing. I'm all now, for that. While all of this, sounds far off it is definitely much closer than you think um mm -hmm. as a matter of fact i wondered has a case already been solved or at least significantly helped by the use of ai so what did i do daniel i asked chat gpt that exact question oh and what a brilliant thing to do yeah just i just hey tell me chat gpt apparently likes to talk about itself they will know <laughs> yeah so I'm like, yeah, tell me about a case where this has happened. They replied, yes, there have been several notable cases where artificial intelligence has played a role in solving crimes. One such case is the murder of Nic Nicole Lavelle in 2016. Hmm. Now, Nicole Lavelle was a 13-year-old girl from Virginia, USA, who went missing in January 2016. Terrible story. Um, not quite cyber stalking, but cyber grooming type situation mm -hmm. you know girl was lonely dealing with some medical things and some guy saw a window and took advantage of it uh oh, tragically man. she goes missing in january 2016 her body found a few days later to help solve this case the blacksburg police department uh, collaborated with a company called threat metrics which specializes in using ai to analyze large amounts of online data by analyzing her social media interactions, chat logs, and other digital footprints, AI algorithms were able to create a profile of her online contacts and activities. This analysis led the investigators to uncover a connection between Nicole and a college student named David Eisenhower. Eisenhower was eventually arrested and charged with her abduction and murder. During the trial, the AI analysis of Nicole's online interactions was presented as evidence, helping to establish the connection between the victim and the suspect. David Eisenhower wound up pleading no contest, and he was sentenced to 50 years in prison. Now, even in telling me about that story, ChatGPT does point out that it's important to note that AI is just a tool in the investigative process, and human yes. expertise and judgment remain crucial in interpreting exactly. the results yeah mm -hmm. and this yeah. i'm telling you this is where like my issue lies <laughs> yeah no i get it I get it's it. an important it's such an important tool to use it really is and it could make or break so many different things but yeah i think cookies I think, don't need to get their hands on <laughs> yeah i think the failure in what happened in your story was they deferred to the ai information as an expert of some kind and well, I think I, it's because I think there is this mindset out there that that's a thing that like it's it's like, yeah. oh, well, it's AI. It is all knowing. Yeah. Like it, it can't possibly be wrong. And it should if be you go deferred into it with to that mindset. It shouldn't yeah. be deferred to for your own judgment. It shouldn't it shouldn't be thought mm -hmm. of like that. Like even with DNA analysis, even with genetic genealogy, um, you might have Parabon come back and say, hey, no, we've identified this DNA. That's definitely uh, Danielle Hallen. The police don't take that result and then all of a sudden you're in jail mm -hmm. they follow you they get another dna sample and they do a one-to-one -one match to make sure oh, okay yep. now we know this is her so they've kind of learned the lesson around that at least with 
you know, genetic genealogy in particular, I think we're going to have to see a couple of these stumbles, like in your case, yeah, exactly. for them to learn these lessons and for those stories to kind of get around. But uh, with this particular story, I verified it. I actually went and looked into it a little more. Uh, well, stick around for one of my extra stories and, and you'll see exactly why. But uh, where is the future of law enforcement AI going to take us? Thinking of the example that ChatGPT raised where social media information led to the suspect, what about trying to, inf to analyze information of that nature to uncover like a network of criminals? Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, like I think I think those types of, of examples are going to be where it's really going to shine in ways where we're like, oh, an analyst probably couldn't have done this or if they could have done yeah. this, it would have taken them years and well, we time came... is of the essence in so many different things. And so, I mean, that it can be the biggest win ever yeah. for law enforcement if it, this goes well. Yeah. Um, and how many times have we heard from law enforcement that social media, that your coverage, my coverage of cases creates too much attention sometimes and floods their tip lines? Yeah. Well, what if you have AI that sifts through that information? Sifts through them. Yeah, and notifies them of trends or information in the tips that seems to tie directly to elements of the case. You know, like it, they, it could really help weed out. Basically, it's it's about processing large, vast amounts of information Absolutely. and finding those those trends. Uh, wouldn't it be great if we could rule out all the varying factors in analysis that comes from medical examiners? Well. Ooh. They now have medical x-rays being analyzed by AI programs, and they're training them to try to determine cause and even manner of death. Interesting. Have you ever heard of a DNA sample that's had mixed profiles? Mm -hmm. What if AI could interpret those and help identify the individual, in, individual contributors? That would be, honestly, that would be awesome. Well, because that's happened so many times. Yeah, that is already being developed at Syracuse University. They won a research award mm -hmm. from the National Institute of Justice. And for those of you out there like me waiting for RoboCop, it's already happened. The Huntington Park no. Police Department in California have deployed a 400 pound robot known as HP RoboCop. Sure, he looks like a giant salt shaker on wheels. Oh. And He's only patrolling a park, but he's full of sensors and he can record and report on crime, any crime that he witnesses there or that people come up and tell him about. So, Danielle, imagine what's going to happen once he gets some arms. Right. Lovely. Can't wait. <laughs> now, uh, you right had now, me up until that moment. Now I'm just like lost no, again. <laughs> you just want him to be the salt shaker with no arms. Uh, <laughs> right now, some say that AI is in its teenage years and... We do know that teenagers sometimes get stuff wrong, but the lessons learned can make them exceptional adults. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, they can also spiral out of control and send Arnold Schwarzenegger back in time to kill your mom. So I guess we're gonna exactly to, we're gonna have to wait to see how this all shakes out. Uh, a big thank you to CBS News, PoliceOne.com, the Yakima Herald, Deloitte.com, PewResearch.org, ChatGPT, and of course, the National Institute of Justice and senior computer scientist, Christopher Regano, which actually it's not a pasta. That's a derivative of oregano based on what I've mm -hmm. learned. But uh, Yummy. Yeah. You're making me hungry. Now, listen. Mm-hmm. All those things really are fantastic. And I think this is why, like I said in the beginning of my story, I have such a struggle, like I struggle so much because I'm such a firm believer in science and advancements in technology and work smarter, not harder. And, you know, find an easier way for everyone that's more accurate. And all those things could, I'm talking completely change the entire atmosphere of true crime, law enforcement agencies. I mean, absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. Like, look, okay, for example, like, look at how much genealogy, like you were saying, look at how much it has changed just in a couple of years of them really pushing it. Like, imagine getting AI heavily involved into law enforcement agencies in a positive way. I think it could be absolutely crazy. And I yeah. really do think it just, it honestly does come down to ensuring it's used as a tool. Well, and know and that- see like an end all be all. Yeah, I did run into- um, one particular thing, Interpol is already trying to put out, they, they call it the AI toolkit. And essentially mm -hmm. it's kind of 
it's it's the first shot that I've seen at setting some type of standards for law enforcement organizations, how they yes. use this stuff, what they could mm -hmm. expect from it. So, um, you know, I, I do think that that dialogue is super important. And then, of oh, course, yeah. making sure that people are paying attention to that. Like I'm seeing it at the level of Interpol. But as I've mentioned in this episode already here mm -hmm. in the U.S., you know, our police systems are not unified. We don't have. No best practices that kind of it's trickle like down. we're in the dang stone age for half this stuff and it's like yeah. how can there this is absolute mad like this was even a conversation me and powell were having yesterday and about you know ai and this that and the other and like how things some things just aren't adding up like you have to train less hours to be a police officer than i had to train to do hair right 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 like and so it's like can we all just like take a second and evaluate <laughs> Yeah, And like, you know, everything needs to be, you know, one solid unified type of situation, especially when you are going to be introducing something like AI, like, especially yeah. if you're going to be introducing something like AI, because that is huge. And if AI is supposed to be used as a tool and can be used so horribly, as we saw in my story, you got to make sure that the police departments it's going to, you know, and the people who have access to it are all on the same page or you're going to have a lot of big problems. Yep. Um, I want to try one last attempt to have AI melt your heart, Daniel. Hmm. So I had a conversation with chat GPT and oh, this conversation went so well that I thought, I should probably make an audio version of this conversation. So I took all the text, I threw threw our little voice stuff on it. So this is AI John's conversation with chat GPT. Do you know who Danielle Hallen is? Danielle Hallen is a YouTuber and true crime content creator known for her popular channel where she discusses and investigates various true crime cases. She gained a significant following by analyzing and sharing her thoughts on unsolved mysteries, cold cases, and true crime stories. Danielle Hallen's videos often provide a detailed examination of the facts, theories, and evidence surrounding different criminal cases. She has developed a dedicated audience interested in true crime and has contributed to raising awareness and generating discussions about these cases. What do you think, Danielle? I'll take it. I will. See, I, I saw you turn. Notes. I literally saw you turn as as it went on. I saw you were first terrified. Yes, Chat I GPT was. knows you, and has a good write up on you. That was which. That's what I was worried about. I was like, this could go either way, depending on you know which random Google search and link you go to. Yeah, yeah. Now <laughs> I also asked about John Lorden. Oh yeah, it, it didn't know who John Lorden was. So I yeah, rephrased. Right. No, it didn't. It didn't. I rephrased. Do you know anything about Lorden Arts? Lorden Arts is a YouTube channel run by John Lorden, who creates true crime content. He is known for his series Brain Scratch, where he delves into various unsolved mysteries, missing persons cases, and true crime stories. John Lorden takes a thorough and analytical approach to examining these cases, often presenting different theories and engaging his audience in discussions. His videos typically involve in-depth research and interviews, aiming to shed light on unresolved mysteries and generate new leads or perspectives. Lorden Arts has garnered a substantial following on YouTube, and John Lorden has become a respected figure within the true crime community. Dang! I like this guy. I'm starting to I like, like him, him too more. right now. Yeah, seriously. As a matter of fact, I was so I was so taken by that moment and that feeling yeah. of like wow chat gpt knows me and thinks I'm I'm a good person like that yeah. kind of feels good. So I mm -hmm. thought what if I let chat gpt know that he was talking to me. That's awesome. I'm John Lorden from Brain Scratch. Do you want my autograph? As an AI language model I don't have personal preferences or the ability to receive physical items such as autographs. However, it's great to connect with you, John Lorden from Brain Scratch. Your dedication to researching and discussing true crime cases has made a significant impact in the true crime community. Keep up the great work. Isn't that crazy? 
okay, listen, next time I'm having a hard day, yeah, I'm just going to go in there and be like, look. <laughs> yeah, tell me about myself, chat GPT. I'm like a personal hype man. I know. As a matter of fact. I can appreciate it. I can appreciate it. I asked him one more question. I'm doing a show with Danielle Hallen later today. Do you want me to give her a message from you? Thank you for the offer. But as an AI language model, I don't have personal messages or the ability to interact directly with individuals outside of this text-based platform. However, I hope you have a fantastic show with Danielle Hallen, and I wish you both an engaging and successful discussion. He's a nice guy, Danielle. Yeah, he is. And this has definitely been a very interesting and engaging discussion. I will say that. <laughs> Oh my gosh. You know, I don't know. I think it's just, you know, all the apprehension that I have. I think AI can be so good. I don't know. I hate to seem like such a naysayer. It's just, I also worry so much about people. You know what I mean? And so it's like, I will always question something until I see that it's like being taken seriously. And you know, all of the negatives are also being looked at just as much as the positives and there are solutions coming out of it, which I do fully have faith will happen. Um, I don't know, because it could be such a great thing to the true crime community. I think there's going to be bumps in the road. And mm -hmm. as long as we pay attention and learn from those bumps, yeah. we'll be okay. But to highlight that, Let's get into our extra stories. Couple more, couple more turns in terms of AI and law enforcement. Now, uh, ChatGPT helping people all over the world, right? You heard how friendly oh, yeah. he is. My number one hype man, right there. Exactly. Uh, he he's even been helping attorneys, Danielle. But wow, this is one of those stories. Comes with a big lesson. Mm -hmm. A man was on a flight when he got hit by a beverage cart and it injured his knee. He decides, I'm going to sue the airline. Well, apparently he must have hired a discount law firm because oh, no. instead of using some underpaid paralegal to do their research, they asked ChatGPT to find examples from other court cases that could help their argument. So our buddy ChatGPT told them about Martinez versus Delta Airlines, Zykerman versus Korean Airlines, and Varghese versus China Southern Airlines. He presented that information in court. Only issue was, for some reason, ChatGPT completely fabricated those court cases and their details. It was all fictionalized. The opposing counsel did actual work, and they tried to find those cases. When they couldn't, they told the judge about it. When the prosecuting attorney was asked about this, he stood by the research, but did admit to relying on ChatGPT, but Danielle, he says he specifically asked ChatGPT to confirm that those cases were real. And it responded that they were. The judge fined the law firm $5,000 for submitting fake legal history in their arguments. And now the world has its first example of a human being, hand, of a human being handing over his brain to be controlled by AI with an evil sense of humor. I asked my new buddy, ChatGPT, about yeah. these specific cases. When I found the case names, I was like, I got to see if this has been you cleaned up. It. Yeah. Uh, no. All of the results now, he is very clear. He's like, that's not a case I'm familiar with. Nope. I'm not finding any information. Tell me more so about how, it. So how do you think that came up? Like, this, see, and this is where I have that distrust. And the then only there's thing, that blind faith again. It's the same yes. thing every time, and it screws everyone over. The only thing I could think of is when you start ChatGPT, you can start mm -hmm. a new conversation or you can continue their old conversations. There's like this panel on the left where you could jump into your yeah. old conversation and pick right back up. ChatGPT remembers context. So people that are used to Google mm -hmm. and just going to Google and doing a search and then all of a sudden do a different search. It, it doesn't take the first search into account. ChatGPT is different. It will remember things that you have talked about in that particular conversation. So if for some reason he had this long conversation thread and he was like, help me write a fake story to read to my children before they go to sleep. And then later oh. in that same thread, he's like, ooh, what about the court case? And it just thinks, oh, I'm still telling him a fake story. Okay, yeah, well, there, that court case is Delta versus blah, blah, blah. 
Um, and this is where people making errors and not realizing that. I'm telling you, there's just so much that can go wrong. There's some context that he had wrong because, yeah. Or yeah. chat GPT, I'm, I'm sure they might have looked at it and tried to, but I don't think there's been any big, I don't know that they're scrubbing information from chat GPT because he's very clear that uh, he only knows things from before September, 2021. So I imagine mm -hmm. that there's like a, a neural network they had to build up and that's kind of yeah. why they they said okay we'll just take information from before this time frame so i don't think you can kind of curb you know yeah. oh we're going to go remove this one piece of bad info especially if it never existed like that had to come from somewhere else he thought he was making something up is what i think i don't know probably and i'm just absolutely astonished that the attorney just went with it what like an idiot didn't even like go like and then there's i think about when i hear heard that i immediately thought about like you and i even just researching this podcast like if we read something even from a reputable source that sounds slightly off we're like wait a minute yeah. and we'll go search like down a whole rabbit hole to make sure it's true and the fact that an attorney used chat gpt for that and then just went not, with it not to mention I mean, like stood by it yeah not to mention i made a joke about like the underpaid paralegal some mm -hmm. of these law firms, they'll use uh, interns, but give them real access, give them, you know, access to the Westlaw exactly. database or to LexisNexis, let them look that up and find the real case. This is just a total misfire, total misuse. Mm -hmm. Big, big lesson. Oh my gosh. Good grief. Well, I have yet another little Debbie down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so February of 2019, 31 year old Najir Parks was arrested and charged with a slew of very, 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 very serious charges, okay? We're talking like aggravated assault, shoplifting, unlawful possession of weapons, possession of marijuana. It was just a whole long list. And it was all in regards to an incident that occurred at a Woodbridge, New Jersey hotel. I guess there was the shoplifting incident that occurred months prior that ended in the perpetrator almost hitting a police officer with a car. Okay, hmm. so they've been like on the hunt for the person responsible. Now, how did they link Najir to the crime? It turned out that a fake ID had been left at the scene. Now, I don't know if they like physically saw him drop it and it was left there. I'm really hoping that's the case. and It's not just more like weird, shoddy police work. But they took this fake ID and used AI facial recognition. And this brought Najir up as being the person on the fake ID. And so they're like, okay, fake ID left here at the crime, matches this guy, everything comes together. And so they arrested him. However, Najir knew he was 30 miles away at a bank at the time this occurred and was able to prove this through photos and receipts. So we're talking like very acceptable forms of an alibi. Mm -hmm. Despite this, it took a year fighting against this AI technology for the case to be dismissed due to lack of evidence. Wow. Wow. And the thing is, and this is what we're talking about, you know, AI can get it wrong and it, it can. Absolutely. It happens. However, the police department had to then look at the two photos of the men and be like, this makes sense. It did not make sense. Oh, <laughs> they really? looked absolutely nothing alike. I mean, I just sat there and I was like, ears are different. Jawline is different. Forehead is much wider and broader. The hairline's completely different. Their eyebrows, it's like totally completely different. No shape. The only similar thing was that they both had a goatee. Wow, that's crazy. Especially because there's and, so many other systems where you could do facial analysis. Like maybe they need to have some mm -hmm. precedence of if you're doing a you know face matching like that, we need five different products that all come up with the same result. Exactly. Or something. There's exactly. gotta be some way to try to corroborate that. That's and nope, crazy. and this poor guy just, he's like, I have receipts. I was at this bank. Like I have the proof of it. I have time, date, everything. And they still tried to argue with him because AI picked him out. And that again is where I'm like, mm -mm, no, yeah. we're not gonna just blindly trust this, please. And thank you, we can't do that. Literally yeah. begging you. <laughs> mm. So uh, last month we learned that Danielle may have stolen $15,000 in animal feed from a local store. Danielle, I want you to imagine that you're a crook, okay. but, but you know what? One of your favorite mm -hmm. acts is coming into town. 
-hmm. Post Malone is playing Cartler Finley Stadium and you have Perfect. tickets, right? Sounds like a dream. <laughs> you go to the stadium with 60,000 other, what what do his fans call themselves? Post Malonials, is that right? <laughs> anyway, you give you give them your ticket, they let you in, you buy a concert shirt and some temporary face tattoos and yeah. you make your way to your seat, but uh-oh, the cops are there waiting for you. They arrest and haul you out, telling you that AI detected you on a camera coming into the stadium. And all that happens before the crappy opening act finishes. Does this disappointment. sound- Disappointment. Yeah, huge disappointment. Does this sound like a futuristic sci-fi nightmare? Nope. Yeah. Nope. Oh boy. It happened mm -hmm. in China which has a network of 170 oh, yeah. million CCTV cameras, and they're installing 300 million more. I was about to say their surveillance over there is absolutely wild. Yes. And with all those cameras, you're not going to pay for an employee on each one of those cameras. They're using AI to process all that info. Mm -hmm. So a man named Mr. Ao went with his wife to see pop star Jackie Chung, along with 60,000 other Chung heads. I hear that Jackie mm -hmm. puts on an amazing show. Now, Mr. Ao knows he's a criminal, but he's thinking, even if police knew he was there, there's no way that they're gonna find him in a crowd of 60,000 people. Yeah, that's a lot of people. Yep, he was wrong. He was taken by police for economic crimes. And he said about the incident, if I knew, I wouldn't have gone to the concert. Oh. <laughs> Pretty, no pretty kidding. good. Yeah, he's 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 a master, master logic person. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, if I knew, I wouldn't have gone to the concert. But you know, you can't just you can't miss Jackie Chung. He's one of Hong Kong's most famous singers, according to the BBC, and he's super handsome. So, oh my goodness, that honestly, I don't know. I kind of, I kind of, I kind of feel that because you know. Something that I say all the time on my channel is like there is someone out there right now that has information on this case that knows what they did and they're just walking around living their average life. I know. Not with that. Not yeah. with that. Just yeah. walk into the grocery store, man. You're gonna be pounced on in the bread aisle. <laughs> they're gonna find you. <laughs> oh, well, I can take it. Well, who is going to win this month? Danielle, what do you think? I don't know, you know. That was pretty good. I feel like that was one of the more intense discussions that we've had on this I podcast. It's such a real serious thing. And man, I feel yeah. such a specific way about it. But And that would have been a know. completely different conversation a year ago yeah. or two years ago. Cause now Oh yeah. Like, you know, I'm learning about this stuff. Like I'm I'm playing with mm -hmm. this technology all the time, just mm -hmm. doing stupid things. But I'm yeah. still I'm getting a sense of it, which I didn't have a year ago. I don't know. You know, based on statistics, I feel like people are probably going to like my story because people think that AI is scary. For sure. But I feel like you put up a, a pretty good fight there and showing how much of a positive thing it could be. And I feel like as lovers of true crime here, mm -hmm. you can't help but want to jump on that bandwagon. So, yeah, I don't know. My vote personally be for you, but it's not up to me. It's up to you guys. You get to decide who made the best case for AI, John with the pros or myself with the cons. That's right. And you can vote for the first seven days at our Twitter account at Crime After Pod or. You can also head over to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com and vote there. We also always have a link in the description box down below. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can click the little letter I up in the corner. And don't be brokenhearted, guys. If if I lose this month, I'm just going to ask chat GPT to tell me more about myself and I'll feel fine within 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> well, honestly. Yeah, I might go do that after this. <laughs> Hi, I need some help. Yeah. At Crime After Crime Podcast, you'll find all the links you ever need, including where to find more content from Danielle and myself, how to join our Patreon and shop our Teespring store. And as always, a massive, massive thank you to our patrons. We have so much fun over there. You guys get a bonus Patreon special segment monthly, which... We're still just rolling them out over there. We're having a great time. You're learning all sorts of new things about John and myself. Mm -hmm. Plus, patrons get a personal shout out in an upcoming Patreon special. That's right. We will be back next month. We are counting down. There's only mm -hmm. three episodes left. Next month, we've got a new topic for you guys. Plain crimes. Mm. 
this could go so many different directions all kinds of ways i i can't wait to see where we where we wind up with that there's going to be no, somehow it's going to be on the same page but <laughs> it always happens <laughs> it does this podcast is produced and hosted by myself daniel hallen and the amazing john lorden and if you enjoyed today's episode please rate or review us on whichever platform you found us on have a great month you guys and we'll see you again soon on crime after crime bye bye